Hi, and welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. My name is Deb Crow, and I will be your host. Join me on this journey as we meet heart-centered leaders from all over the globe. Lots of interesting questions, interesting conversation, and find out what makes a leader. How do they handle uncertainty and complexity? How do they lead in a time that is volatile? Join us. Welcome back to Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. And we've just come out of the gate of 2021 with, again, just a lineup of amazing heart-centered leaders. And I want to introduce you to a woman who I actually met through my daughter going to school in Ottawa at Carleton University. Her name is Dr. Kim Hellmans. She's the teaching professor and she's the current chair of the Department of Neuroscience at Carleton University. Kim received her PhD from Queen's University where her research focused on understanding the biological basis of drug addiction. Kim later went on to complete postdoctoral positions at Cambridge University and the University of British Columbia prior to joining Carleton in 2008. Kim has received several prestigious awards for her passion and her dedication to university teaching. Four months ago, Kim was rewarded a Minister's Award of Excellence. She has worked diligently to ensure that students have had the learning and mental health support that they have needed to transition to online learning during this COVID-19 pandemic. So Dr. Kim, welcome to Imperfect. Thank you for having me. And you're a fellow podcaster. I'm excited to talk about your podcast, Minding the Brain. So if you're ready, Kim, I will dive right in with my questions. Absolutely. First leadership question is, can you share with the listeners where your love of neuroscience derived from? Well, I would say I probably didn't really know what neuroscience was uh, until I was kind of midway through my undergraduate degree. I, I started my training at McGill University back in the in the late 90s, and I was doing a psychology degree with an interest in doing clinical psychology or, you know, therapeutic, uh, some kind of therapeutic role. And midway through my courses, I, you know, I started learning about the brain. I started, you know, McGill has a very rich history of being founded in in cognitive neuroscience. We had Donald Hebb, who was considered the father of modern cognitive neuroscience. He was a professor at at McGill in in the 40s and 50s. And, uh, so I started learning about neurons and, you know, how, when you manipulate certain parts of the brain, it changes behavior. And I thought, oh, this is, this is actually pretty cool. And at the same time, I was also learning that science didn't really understand what caused mental illness. And so I kind of changed tack and realized, you know, as much as I loved the idea of, you know, therapy and, and helping others, I wanted to be the one working behind the scenes to try to figure out what caused mental illness. And so I um, was quite lucky in, at McGill University, you do a, an honors thesis or a research project in your third and fourth year of your degree studies. And so I started working in a lab in my third year, continued in the same lab in my fourth year that was essentially a, a neuroscience lab in the Department of Psychiatry there. And that's really where it started. Well, as a previous case manager in the community, I'm, I'm intrigued to talk to you more about your research and, and kind of what led you that down that path. And I just, before I ask you that question, I want to ask you the question that I like to give to all my guests. What imperfections do you feel you bring to your heart-centered leadership? Well, I would say I bring a lot of imperfection, um, mainly because I, I think I approach my leadership with humility. And just for those of you that are tuning in, I'm not only a professor in, in the Department of Neuroscience, I'm also the, the chair. And what that means is I have a lot of uh, administrative roles and do a lot of leadership in that capacity. So I lead not only in my classroom, but also with my peers. And I think 
I've always approached that, you know, leadership in, in general and now, you know, increasingly so as I rise above, rise in the ranks at, at Carleton is knowing that I'm not, I'm not the one with all the answers. I, I, I believe leaders, leadership shouldn't be, I'm the one that knows and everybody else should just listen and follow in line with what I'm doing. I think there's a certain amount of humility that needs to come in to accept that you don't always have the answers and that people around you are, are part of your conversation and can inform your decision making. And certainly as a leader, you, you know, you often are the one that has to make the decisions. Um, but you don't always have to be the one that f says, you know, I'm not a dictator by any stretch of the imagination. So I think I bring humility. Uh, I think I bring in um, patience, uh, forgiveness. Uh, I think I make, I make mistakes. I think others around me make mistakes. And I think that that's, um, that is imperfection, right? It's, it's recognizing that there are chips in the china and there's a crack in the in in the cup and that sometimes that's what brings the beauty to quote leonard cohen right <laughs> absolutely i let you it, the light in. it makes me it makes me think of two things and being at the helm whether you're a university professor or a co-chair or right up to a c-suite leader because you're at the helm doesn't mean you have everything figured out. You have a vision, but it's a shared vision. So I love the way that you framed that. And that shared vision is what makes up the team. And it's part, two, I, I like calling it falling forward. And that's where we, we mm -hmm. learn as a team and when we lead people. And I think when leaders have people follow them and they model the imperfections within their heart-centered leadership, I love that the foundation for you is, is humility and you didn't get to where you were by not making mistakes. So such a lovely way to frame that. Uh, I'm going to throw in an extra question here because I'm excited about your podcast. So you've got a very popular podcast that you co-host when you're not in the classroom called Minding the Brain. Where did this passion initiative come and what have you learned by doing your podcast? So I co-host this podcast, Mining the Brain. Uh, for those of you that are interested, you can find us on any of your podcasting sites, but we're also on uh, the great wide web, uh, miningthebrainpodcast.com. And I co-host it with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Davies, who's a cognitive scientist at Carleton University. And essentially, we, you know, we were kind of coming up with the idea of doing the podcast independently. And we just so happened to be having lunch one day, and I mentioned that one of my students was doing an independent study with me and drafting up uh, the script for podcasts. And he said, oh, I've always wanted to do a podcast. I even have the name of the podcast. And because he's a cognitive scientist, he had thought of the, the name Minding the Mind. And he said, why don't we do it together? And then we would be minding the brain because he's the mind and I'm the brain. So uh, we, we kind of went, yes, let's do this. Let's do this. This is great because we both, Jim and I both share uh, a love of, of science communication. We both really love teaching. We're both, uh, you know, award-winning professors at Carleton and really enjoy the process of having a conversation about science in a way that is accessible to the general public. And so, you know, that's kind of really the, the real impetus behind Minding the Brain was br making the science accessible and, and having a conversation that wasn't so like pop science so much um and not so inaccessible at a very very high level like only talking to our peers which is what we tend to do with our publications but kind of in the mid-range where we're really able to speak about uh topics that are uh you know both of us would know quite a bit about uh, but at a level that is you know making it fun making it engaging and and educating still the public around topics related to science cognitive psychology neuroscience psych etc well, I love that. And I'm definitely going to check it out. I had a neurosurgeon on my podcast last year who I absolutely just love, Dr. Katrina Furlick. She wrote a book that really changed the dynamics of how I case managed back in 2006 called Another Day in the Frontal Lobe. 
And it's funny because I, jo I joked with her during the interview to say that I had lent the book out to somebody and I didn't make note of who I lent it out to. So now I got a signed copy and she said it's it's fun that I help exercise her brain by having good quality conversation. So I, I hear the eagerness and just the passion in creating a podcast. So it's fun for, to have another fellow podcaster. It's fun being on the other side of the mic and and, and I share your passion about neuroscience and, and the brain wholeheartedly. My third question is, I'm really uh, interested in your research. Uh, as a previous community-based case manager, I had exposure to many clients on my caseload who had drug addiction, and it really affects so many people globally. And I know the stats have increased with the pandemic. And the last time I had looked at the stats through CMHA, I know that on an international scale, the statistics, again, depending on what substance was being consumed, but I know it's estimated that nearly 5% of the world's population have some form of illicit substance. Uh, 240 million people around the world use alcohol problematically and approximately 15 million people are using in injection drugs. So my question for you from a leadership perspective is where did your interest come for your research in this and how did it land up aligning with your love and the work that you've done around mental health? So um, I really do, you know, my, my interest in addiction, I think, you know, some people say it's obvious, uh, you know, might be something that you have a family member or a loved one that has struggled with some form of an addiction and that kind of usually inspires people. But I don't have anybody in my, you know, that's not really where I came from. I came really looking at addiction from... Um, really an intellectual curiosity of trying to understand why it was, as you said, that some people um, can use drugs and use substances quite recreationally with no very little uh, ill effect or very low harms, and others uh, escalate their use and develop compulsive behaviors around their substance use or even their behavioral addictions. And so that was really, it was came at it from a really intellectual perspective early on. But as I've come to really study addiction and I've moved from more animal research to human research uh, I would say my, my impetus and my motivation has very much changed and I recognize the that addictions come from places where folks have often really horrible histories of trauma uh, lots of life stress uh, folks that exist in, in they're some of the most marginalized individuals in our society. And so now my, this, my interest is really focused from a really perspective of humanity that I, that some of these folks are, are really the people that are so disregarded in our society and so heavily stigmatized and oppressed. And now I, I approach this, this desire for, for understanding the how, the what, the why, the how we can make it better with trying to empower some of the, these folks that have so little power in our society and trying to make them make it a better, have the, have, have a better life. Right. Um, so I think about in, improving the wellness of our society, um, because realistically, you know, so many, so many of those folks are not living well. And as you say, particularly now, given the global pandemic, we're seeing escalating numbers of individuals that are using substances and, and to great ill effect. And, you know, we are existing in an opioid overdose crisis. So, yeah, it's 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 really it's changed. I mean, you know, my motivations, my desires, my vision has really changed. And as I mentioned early on in my, you know, when I was in my graduate degrees and my postdoctoral training, I was trained as an animal researcher, as doing bench, bench science. Um, but I developed uh, a rat allergy and was unable to work in a laboratory environment and made the decision to leave research and engage in a, in a career in university teaching. But once again, things have changed. And even though I'm in a, in a teaching role at Carleton, I have developed a side research interest looking at substance use and addiction among student populations. So now um, that's kind of, you know, my interests are sort of 
really overlapping where, you know, I'm really interested in the student experience. I'm really engaged with trying to, you know, understand what makes students succeed in my classroom. And the big piece of how they're succeeding in my classroom has to do with how they're doing outside of the classroom. So I've recognized over my 12 years at Carleton that, you know, seeing some students that are really, really not doing well with their mental health, really struggling, that translates to them not being successful in my classroom. And we know that there is this relationship between mental health and, and, and retention, uh, whether they stay in your classes, your programs, and your university. And so I kind of have now overlapped my um, research history and, and, and trying to understand, you know, the roots of addiction and now overlaying that my interest in student mental health. So what I look at now is the relationship between student mental health, substance use, and their academic outcomes. So trying to understand how all those pieces kind of fit together. So now, uh, you know, I would say the person I am today is very different than the person I was 20 years ago, uh, their student that I was. And I've, I've really carved a very unique and different path um, to, to make my career quite different and quite exciting. And so not only am I teaching in the classroom, I'm also investigating questions outside the classroom. And I'm, and I'm also really heavily engaged in, as I'm sure you're aware, community outreach, trying to take, uh, have my students be the next generation of leaders, taking their knowledge from my classroom and bringing it to the community and empowering the voices of the impressed and, um, translating the content to make it so that Canadians all over the, and those all over the world are living better lives. Well, I love that for two reasons. And I can see why not only are you a professor, but why you are uh, a chair of the department. And I can see why provincially you were awarded uh, an award of excellence because your passion has such a holistic approach. And it's not just about a curriculum that you need to get through and, and hope that it's received on the other side and, and marks on a page. And, you know, the first kind of initial skill set that you want to think of. So it just, it makes me smile from ear to ear as a parent with university age children that there's professors like you. But the bigger thing for me, Kim, is your heart centered leadership is so deep and so passionate. And it almost sounds when you answered there that there was a little bit of an element of surprise, the trajectory that your career has taken. And it's just, it's fascinating to me. And, and I think you're on the right path. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show. So I just, uh, I see nothing but continued success and it'll be fun to, to follow and, and see where you go next. My last question, of course, I have to ask you this. What fascinates you the most about the human brain? Ooh. <laughs> um, what fascinates, hmm. I think what fascinates me most is the fact that it, it's, I see the human brain as almost this, uh, the last frontier of understanding the body, right? It's, you know, the, the very intellectual exercise of, of having my brain trying to think to understand my own brain. <laughs> It's almost like a Mobius strip of uh, confusion, right? That, you know, it is such this complex organism. And I think the amount that we know is really the tip of the iceberg. We still do not understand how the physical structure of our brain creates the mental structure of our mind. You know, it's 2020, we've put people, or it's 2021, we've put people on the moon, we've developed a vaccine for uh, a, a pan pandemic, a virus that's, you know, w was projected to t take us three years, but we still don't really understand um, basic brain function. I mean, we have some hints, but it, it to me, it's, it's something I, you know, I joke that we need to continue to recruit into our nerd n-e-u-r-d army because uh there's still so much that we need to know so yeah the very the very unknowingness of the brain is what fascinates me oh me too and i i would love to uh to chat with your colleague uh dr jim about his love of cognition because i i always love using the word uh the term metacognition it's so neat to think about how we think about things and you're right mm -hmm. it is such a complex 
organism, but I kind of love the Western slant to it, the last frontier. It really is. Mm -hmm. It could be, I could see you doing a paper or something on that. So I, I'm going to plant that seed. Oh, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm, I'm going to switch to my, my fab four. I know something's going to come out. And when I, when I see it, I, I'm going to have a little chuckle and it'll, it'll bring me back to this memory of this amazing conversation. I'm going to ask you four fun questions and, and we just want to know a little bit about Kim and whatever's sitting on the top of your mind. So my first question on my fab four is tell us something that we don't know about you. Oof, <laughs> these are deep. <laughs> uh, tell us something that we don't know about you. Um, hmm. I have, I've always been an imposter. Uh, my father was in the army and we moved every two years on average throughout my life from when I was six months old, born in Ottawa and then moved to London, Ontario and so on and so on and so forth. And I think because, um, I was, I grew up with so much change and so much newness and uh, re-entering schools and friendship circles and countries and you name it, everything was new every two years. Um, I think what that gave me was, you know, on, on the one side of the coin, it, it made me realize how often I felt like an outsider and, and an imposter. And I, how I always have had to combat that feeling, even as being a woman in science, even being uh, a woman who, you know, dresses uh, with flair and loves shoes and makeup and hair. Uh, you know, sometimes I feel like an exotic bird. Um, I think on the flip side of that coin, what it does is it gives me a deep appreciation for folks who do feel like they're always on the outside. And I think when I dig deep about why I have this passion for um, advocacy around mental health and people with lived experience with substance use disorders, I think it stems from the fact that I'm kind of always fighting for the people who don't seem to fit in. So, yeah. Well, you've got something in common with the girl on the other side of the mic talking to you right now, because I also moved every two years of my life, and oh. I, I have never heard it framed like that. And I do think that we combat that feeling, because you're always changing and reintegrating in a new friend uh, circle. And it's that social awareness that almost causes unease and it finally stopped for me in high school I landed up going to the same high school for the whole time but from kindergarten to grade nine every two years new city new rural community the whole the whole thing that you just framed so isn't that interesting and look what you're doing now yeah. and and I'm aligned with you I'm I'm for the underdog as well so isn't it interesting how our yeah our upbringing and our experiences kind of frame who we become in, in our work world, if you will. So interesting. My next mm. question is, do you have a word or do you pick a word for the year? And if you do, what is it? And if you don't, is there a mantra that you have for 2021? So last year, um, well, actually two years ago when I took on my chairship, I had like mantras and I'll tell you them and this year it's changed. So when I took on the chairship, it, uh, it, it, you know, back to that thing about feeling like an imposter, I was so nervous about taking on this big role. Um, and it made me think of that, that saying, oh, but what if I fall? Oh, my darling, but what if you fly? And so when I took on the chairship, I'm, I made myself think of like three things at the end of every day. It was a two. It was neuroscience, not neurosurgery. Nobody's dying. That was my one mantra. And then stuff gets done. Stuff doesn't get done. Go home. So it just kind of grounded me to remind myself to not always worry about the huge workload and that things could wait. And then the last one, yeah, it was react, uh, respond, don't react, right? So be patient with people, be patient with myself. Sometimes you get these like really, really 
angry emails and you get upset people and it's normal to kind of want to react and to re- and to just kind of fire off something right away but um i think being the chair has kind of made me more more mindful and more patient and more compassionate with others because i'm able to take that step and take that deep breath uh, and kind of you know before i do any say anything or do anything that i might regret and this year, as I kind of enter into my, my last six months of my chairship in the middle of a global pandemic, and I think the, the word that I have that I sit on is grace. We are all needing of and, and existing in a state of grace, you know, as the events around us globally uh, unfurl in last year, last week with the U.S., there's just so many things that, um, you know, make us kind of worry and and think oh you know it's it's easy to stumble into despair um but i think having that grace and reflecting on on being in a state of grace is is what's going to get us through these next few months six months a year let's hope not longer absolutely and and i think that's a perfect word and my word for this year is joy and uh one of my clients gave me a cute little Christmas ornament, uh, wooden, and it just has two simple words on it, choose joy. And I thought, much like you just framed our last year and all of the global events, I think when we're joyful and we have grace, I think it extends an opportunity for us to really lean into the virtue of patience and take that pause, take that breath. I'm a big yoga teacher, so I think breathing and a yoga mat can solve 99% of our problems. Even if they're not problems, they're still thoughts and emotions and feelings that are heavy on our minds. So I like that. That's the first grace that I've had for 2021. So it's just a nice word to anchor on in, in, uh, in uncertain times. Third question. If you had to sit down with the 15 year old version of Kim, what advice would you give her? Trust people around you when they tell you that you have talent. (laughs) I think I, I've had sort of this reluctance. Um, I think it's the imposter syndrome. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, not being ever thought of as the smart kid. That was not really the moniker people used for me. I was the cute, the cute one. My sister was the smart one. Um, you know, I've had my, my grade 11, grade 12 biology teacher saying, oh, you're, you know, you're really gifted in science. You should go into science. Okay. Whatever. Um, roll my eyes. Uh, my uh, thesis supervisor in uh, my fourth year of my undergrad saying, oh my goodness, you take to this like a, a duck to water. Um, she was talking about my surgical skills and, you know, I was like, well, can ev- can everybody do this? I mean, come on, you know, and, and all through my life, I've had mentors and, and, and sages around me kind of guiding me into my path. And I've made the mistake at times of not really listening, um, not trusting. Uh, I think self-doubt is, is so strong. And I, I had the, the, um, the benefit of seeing Michelle Obama, uh, who spoke uh, in Ottawa, I think about a year and a half ago, I went and saw her speak. And one of the questions she was asked was, um, when did you know that you were getting in your own way or something? You know, I'm paraphrasing and I thought, oh my gosh, that's such a great, you know, like sometimes it's getting our own way of our own successes. And um, I think sometimes I just, if I was talking to my 15 year old self, I would say, just pay attention to the the people around you that may be critical of you at times, but also are, are trying to give you advice and to raise you up and raise you to be existing in your, you know, in your greatest power. And um, yeah, that's what I would say. I love that. And I, I love how you aligned it with feeling like an imposter. And uh, I think we do get in our own way, but I think the, the glory, or as you would say, so beautifully, the grace 
is the recognition to remove that weight from our shoulders. Take a breath, don't react, and just really step into your greatness, which is what I think you've done. And you are such a great role model for teaching, for academic excellence, and for being a heart-centered leader. And I think the world needs more heart-centered leaders right now. So my last question is a fun one to talk about with anybody in neuroscience. And what do you dream about? What's on your bucket list? What's something that you're still holding around your heart that gives you butterflies that you're still really dreaming and wishing for? I think right now I still really just, <laughs> I don't know if it's because of the state that we're in. I want to do a lot more traveling. I want to see a lot more of the world. I think for so long, I was so anxious to, to, to be rooted and planted in one place. And, um, you know, I would hear of people who had wanderlust and they, you know, want to travel and go to exotic spaces. I, oh, I just want to sit still. And now I've been in Ottawa, you know, it's the longest I've ever been in one place, uh, 12 years. And I think now I'm just ready to go out and see more of the world and have more adventures. Um, I think my kids are at an age now that, that we can start bringing them and, and reinitiating those, those travels. Um, but yeah, and then for my career, I don't know, I feel like I'm living my dream. I think um, when I think back to 12 years ago, when I had that existential crisis and was wondering what on earth am I going to do with my life? I've been trained for research for 15 years and I can't even be in a lab setting. What am I going to do? The thought of having a teaching profession, profession was so like this pipe dream. Uh, and now I'm living it and, and I just, every day, you know, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for, for my job and for my students and my colleagues. I, I'm genuinely as happy as it could get with my career. Um, so, Hey, live in the moment, live in the joy, live in the bliss. Yeah. Well, it's quite funny that you ended it with that. Cause that's, uh, the quote that I'm going to end the show with. Uh, I, I, first of all, want to say thank you, Kim Hellman's. You are an absolute delight, uh, open invitation anytime for an intellectual stimulating conversation. I'm all in fellow imposter here and thank you for your teaching excellence. And on a personal note, I just want you to know what an impression you left on our daughter, Christine and her pursuit of neuroscience and just showing her that anything's possible and providing such a fun environment uh, pre-COVID, during COVID, and just being that approachable prof that is there for her students. I, From the bottom of my heart, I want to thank you as a parent, as a podcast host and fellow podcaster. Thank you for being so open to share your time and expertise because I know you're a busy lady. I asked you last fall. And you said, I can't do it till January. And I said, that's okay. You're worth the wait. So grateful. Thank you to you. Thank you. It's, it's wonderful to, to answer these great questions. It, it's putting me in this great reflective space. And yeah, Christine is, is a, was a true pleasure to teach. And she's why I keep, keep going. It's, it's students like her every day gets me up in the morning. Well, I'm going to end with a quote from Buddha, which is, just quite in alignment of our conversation. Do not dwell in the past. Do not dream of the future. Concentrate the mind on the present moment. So this is Deb Crow. Thank you once again for joining me on Imperfect, the Heart-Centered Leadership Podcast. <laughs>